as if you hadn't had enough of my speaking earlier in the forenoon session. This is Urban's way of uh, sort of putting you to sleep by giving me yet another session in the afternoon. Now, uh, the title that I was asked to speak on was uh, India's Options in Afghanistan. Let's understand, uh, first of all, let's understand what Afghanistan has gone through. And I take it that all of you have a certain basic knowledge about Afghan history. Uh, but in 2014, Afghanistan went through two very specific transitions. First was the political transition. Or what was the political transition? You know, the presidential election. Because since 2001, after the Taliban were thrown out, President Karzai has been there. Now, initially, he was heading the interim government, then the transition administration, and then there was an election that took place in 2004. He was elected president. Then in 2009, there was another election. He was again elected president. And 2014 was therefore the next presidential election year. And that was a political transition. It becomes significant because from the end of the Taliban, it was always President Karzai. And uh, as you, I'm sure all of you know, President Karzai is a great friend of India. I think uh, he's, uh, maybe there are Afghan students who come here to Manipal, I don't know, uh, in different uh, schools. But that was the political transition. <coughs> this transition was not an easy transition. In the Afghan system, the presidential election, uh, it's a two-stage election. What happens is that, uh, let's say, in the first round, you have, uh, say, 10 people contesting for the post of president. Unless one of them gets more than 50% of the vote, what will happen is that the top two will go through a runoff round. Let's say you have the first round, there are 10 people, somebody gets 30%, uh, somebody gets 27%, somebody gets 25%, and so on and so on. And somebody gets 4%. Then the guys who got 30% and 27% will be will form the final runoff slate. The rest, eight, will uh, vanish. And uh, maybe they will announce their allegiance to one or the other, so that chances are that that vote bank will get added on to the other fellows, hopefully in the runoff round. That's the system. So the first round was held on the 5th of April. And two people who came out as the leaders, one was Dr. Abdullah, who got 44%. And the second person was Dr. Ashraf Ghani, who got 32%. Dr. Abdullah is seen as uh, Tajik, one of the main ethnic groups. He was a former foreign minister. By training, he is an ophthalmologist and was closely associated with uh, the famous uh, fighter commander of Afghanistan known as Ahmad Shah Massoud, about whom um, many books have been written, including fictional novels and things like that. Dr. Ashraf Ghani, who, got, who came second with 32% as a Pashtun, which is the big ethnic group, which accounts for something like about 45-46% uh, of the population. And Pashtuns have traditionally been rulers of Afghanistan. Their kings have all been Pashtuns, I'm sure. Now, uh, he got 32%. He is uh, he's a former finance minister. He was quite young when he left Afghanistan, and uh, he stayed for most of his life in the United States. He was a senior World Bank official. He spent most of his career uh, in the World Bank and came back under President Karzai to be finance minister, just as Dr. Abdullah joined President Karzai's government as uh, foreign minister. So this was the round one, 44%, 32%. High turnout, 58% turnout in the election. So the second round was announced on 14th of June. This was the runoff round. Now in this runoff round, uh, Dr. Ashraf Ghani got 56% of the vote. The votes cast was actually higher than what, was, what it was in the first round. 
And uh, so the turnout was close to 60% instead of 58%. Dr. Ashutani got 56% and Dr. Abdullah got the balance, namely 44%, because now there were only two candidates. Uh, Dr. Abdullah alleged that there had been uh, election fraud because he felt that how is it possible that my vote has remained at 44%, the number of people casting their vote has gone up. And uh, many of the people, because if you total up 44 and 32, that works out to about 76, so there were other candidates with 24% of the vote some of whom had announced that they were supporters of Dr. Abdullah in the final round. And so naturally he said that, you know, at least some of those guys should have voted for me, so why is it that? And uh, he said, I do not accept this and so on. So then there were calls made because this was a very important transition. And uh, President Kazai had said, I am going to hand over power, I'm, I'm not going to uh, continue. So for the stability, and you know the international community had been so heavily involved in the stability and uh, rebuilding of Afghanistan that uh, everybody sort of came down, the UN Secretary General, the Americans, you know, uh, President Obama made a couple of phone calls to both Ashraf Ghani and to Abdullah. Kerry came down there twice, in July and then in August after about three weeks, saying, you know, you can't uh, back off like this. And uh, eventually, even though the UN carried out a comprehensive audit of the election, which meant they actually recounted every single vote, but then uh, they withheld the results. And finally, on 29th of September, what was done was, there was a national unity government that was put into place. Now, the national unity government was headed by uh, President Ashraf Ghani. He was declared president. Dr. Abdullah said that uh, he was made a co-equal by creating a post for which actually there is no provision in the constitution of Afghanistan, a post called that of the CEO. Now, how you divide the powers between the president and the CEO is something which has not yet been worked out. The idea was that this will be a national unity government. It was decided that they would put together a cabinet. Now, as you can well imagine, um, it meant a division of spoils because both sides felt that, you know, if this guy gets home ministry, then I must get defense ministry. If this guy gets finance, then I must get commerce and industry or something like that. So balancing. Eventually, all this happened, and it's only about last week that um, the cabinet was announced. I'm just giving you this background to indicate to you the fragile nature of the political transition and the fact that the Americans had to do a lot of heavy lifting, heavy diplomatic lifting in order to make sure that the outcome of the election was eventually respected. Because if, you know, if uh, Dr. Abdullah had backed off and said, I don't, expect, I don't accept this result, then the whole election process would have been discredited. And that meant that the whole effort towards political stability would have received a very uh, huge setback. So, but it required the Americans. I mean, everybody had earlier talked about national unity government. We talked about it and so on and so on. But ultimately, it took the weight of the Americans to be able to make sure that these two guys, Ashraf Ghani and uh, Abdullah, were together. We'll see how this transition progresses. But at the moment, it is holding. They've just come up with a new cabinet. This by way of giving you background, because unless you understand this, tra these transitions that are underway, it becomes very difficult to then define what are India's options. The second transition that took place is the security transition. Now, the security transition meant that by end of, by 31st December 2014, the US had announced that it would end its combat operations in Afghanistan and hand over responsibility for security to the Afghan National Security Forces, namely the Afghan Army and the Afghan Police. Now, the US had gone in, as you would know, uh, after 9-11, 2001. Gradually, the US presence there had been built up. President Obama, when he came to power, he had, before coming to power in his election campaign, he had announced very categorically 
that uh, while Iraq was an unnecessary war, and he said we are going to end this, he called Afghanistan as a necessary war, as a legitimate war. And it is a fact that more than 50 countries had sent their, had sent their troops to be part of the International Security <coughs> Assistance Force. However, the largest number of troops at any point in time were obviously Americans. And uh, at one point in time, the Americans had something like um, 150,000 soldiers at one point in time, which was by far the largest. And uh, the second highest was the British, who had at their peak something like about 10,000. So you can see the gap between the American contribution. Oh, another way of looking at it, the total number of foreign soldiers killed in Afghanistan in, from 2001 to 2014 was roughly about 3,500. The total number of foreign soldiers killed. Out of the 3,500, something like um, 2,350 or thereabouts were American. So when Americans talk about their contribution in terms of blood and treasure, as they call it, uh, it is significant compared to the rest of the international community. However, the Operation Enduring Freedom, which is what this operation was called, it ended. And now what the Americans have there is Operation Resolute Support, uh, under which they have something like about uh, 10,000 or thereabouts, who are largely there, not in an active combat role, but in terms of training and providing a certain amount of support to the Afghan security forces. The Afghan security forces, incidentally, today number at 352,000. Uh, Afghanistan's economy cannot sustain this kind of a security structure. 352,000 is both the police and the uh, army. And uh, so, in terms of the, in terms of making sure that this continues or they get their salaries, they will require something like about four billion dollars every year from the international community, from which NATO has committed to provide. Out of, again, out of this $4.1 billion every year, the large chunk is American, about two and a half. The cost of this war for America, financial cost, according to the Congressional Research Service, which is the US, you know, US Congress has its own uh, research service. Uh, they produce their reports, many of them are available on the internet. According to the last CRS report in December of last year, the cost of the Afghan war is estimated at $686 billion. However, Harvard University has did another survey according to which the real cost is estimated at something like $2 trillion. So it's, now out of this, whether you, whichever figure you want to take, I leave that to your judgment. But out of this, the figure that the US spent on Afghanistan's reconstruction and development is about $104 billion. That's the total amount of money that was spent on reconstruction. So whatever the sum of money, $686 billion as the total cost of the war, or $2 trillion as Harvard would like to believe, doesn't matter. But out of that, the point I'm making is that essentially, the, the, that means that the largest chunk of that money went into security. To give you an idea about the difference, it costs about $2 million to keep one American soldier employed in Afghanistan at every year. With his salary, his equipment, his holidays, his leave, his whatever, insurance and so on and so on. Which is very high compared to what it would cost to have an Afghan soldier. Even after America pays for its equipment and training and salary and everything else. That cost is about $220,000. Whereas it is $2 million for one soldier. So there is a huge difference, which is why America is taking on the lion's share of the financial burden. Now, out of 104 billion that went into Afghan reconstruction, it is not as if nothing has changed in Afghanistan. Huge changes have taken place. If you look back in 2001, Afghanistan's GDP at that time was $2 billion. Today it is $20 billion. It's gone up by 10 times. Life expectancy was 41 years. 40 years. Today it has become 61 years in Afghanistan. At that time, there were, in all of Afghanistan, there were only about 9 lakh boys going to school. Today, there are 80 lakh children going to school. 
out of which 27 lakhs are girls. So, you know, that is, there are huge changes that have taken place. Literacy levels have gone up from 12% to 33%. Urbanization has become 50%. 50% of the population in Afghanistan is living in towns and cities, which incidentally, which as a percentage is higher than what it is in India. So, you know, lots of changes have taken place. It's not as if they haven't. And in this, economic development and reconstruction has been India's primary role. Uh, we, have, we have contributed something like $2 billion to Afghanistan's reconstruction. And we have run by far, by far, the most effective economic cooperation program compared to any other country, compared to any other international development agency. The reason for that is that uh, our programs were run on a very frugal basis. They were run in close concentration with the local authorities and the local government. And uh, we did not put any administrative overheads. You know, we are not a traditional donor country in the sense that while we have some economic cooperation programs within our region, within our neighborhood, by and large we don't have, uh, India does not have the equivalent of a USAID if you know, you know, the US Agency for International Development, or UK has something called DFID, or Canada has its own SIDA and so on. We don't have that. So what happens is, or World Bank, or UNDP, so the moment you get assistance out of these international organizations, I'll give you a simple example. Uh, Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh came to visit, first visit, he came there uh, when I was there in 2005, it was 2005 August, and uh, he and President Karzai had this meeting, I uh, was sitting there. At that time, we used to give 14 scholarships a year to Afghan students to come and study in India under ISIS year, 14. And we had uh, some short term, you know, under ITEC, Indian Technical and Economic Cooperation, which provides professional training courses, something like three months, six months, short term courses. For people who are already working, let's say you're working in a finance, in the Ministry of Finance and you need a three-month accounting course. So you were working in the Ministry of IT and you need a six-month uh, IT-related course. Something like that. And we used to have maybe about 30, 40 of these kind of short-term training fellowships. President Karzai, for those of you who may not know, he did his college university education in India, in Himachal, and uh, has always had a very a great soft spot for India. I mean, he thinks what he is is because of Indian education, and the, his commitment to democracy, his commitment to pluralism is all something that he inculcated while he was studying in India, traveling around in India, making Indian friends and so on. So here you have Dr. Manmohan Singh, who is an economics professor, um, and President Karzai sitting together, mm -hmm. and uh, President Karzai tells Dr. Manmohan Singh, Mr. Prime Minister, you know, we have to rebuild an entire generation and a whole generation is lost because if you remember civil war you know began 79 or even before 79 when the communists took over in 73 so we have to rebuild the whole generation has been wasted in the fighting and insurgency that has taken place so dr manmohan singh said yes of course so what can we do please tell us mr president we are ready to help you so he said um, i need Scholarships. I need to send Afghan students out to study in India. I believe that the Indian education is the best education because after studying in India, if we send people to study in America, most of them will never come back. They will stay there. When we send them to India, we know that they will come back. So I want them to go and learn about Indian habits or whatever. Anyway, so he said yes. So send me. So, President Karzai turns to how many scholarships? So President Karzai turns to him and says, Mr. Prime Minister, I need 1,000 scholarships every year. So, Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh sort of realized that this was a huge number. And I was, since I was the ambassador, he looked at me and uh, he said, how many scholarships do you need? <laughs> <laughs> so, he realized that, you know, there's a huge gap and uh, so he said, Mr. President, let's do it like this. 
we will give you 500 scholarships every year. And we will increase the short term training courses also to 500 every year. President Kazai, no, no. He said, thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. Great. Now, so what happened was, this was in August. Now, you know, we were handing 14 scholarships a year. So I had uh, the number of people I had in my MEC was reasonably small. One of those guys, during the month of December, January, February, when you know people would be applying, foreign students would be applying to Indian colleges and universities, would also handle these, uh, I mean, maybe 100 guys would apply for 14 scholarships. And then, you know, we would send ahead, you'd make sure they had all the copies of various certificates and make photocopies, you know, translate them where necessary and send it. So maybe 100 application forms. So one chat, part of the time, during the months of January, February, we do this. Now, that we had 500. We didn't know where to start. So we went to the Ministry of Education. We ended up with something like 25,000 application forms. People sat in the office till 11 o'clock at night for more than a month at a stretch, just to care all this. Eventually, the difference is now, if the same project was being done, Let's say you had the same, then after that I managed to get one guy from ICCI to handle the burden of scholarships for the next year. But the way international development agencies works, UN works or World Bank works, the first thing they would do is, uh, I mean if I was the UN and Dr. Manmohan Singh was my boss in the UNDP and he said, uh, Rakesh, we are going to increase the number of scholarships from 14 to 5 up. So I calculate and I would say, okay, so many more applications. One chap can handle so many, so I would make a list. I would say, sir, I need one fellow at the level of director, one fellow, two guys at the level of deputy secretary or under secretary, so many clerks, so many, one finance guy, uh, so many photocopiers, so many computers, and this is the salary, and this office space, and so many vehicles for them, and so on. And I would say that this cost, add to this, the cost of the 500 scholarships. And that's how it would be built. So, in normally in a place like Afghanistan, the actual delivery on the ground for international aid and assistance is something like 20-25%, which means that if a country has said $100, then only about 20-25 are actually going to, or to benefit the local population. The rest is all administrative overheads. It becomes that huge. So when I say that the Indian program was the most effective, <coughs> It was because we had zero overheads. We absorbed all the overheads ourselves. Now, even the guy who came from ICCR to handle scholarships, etc., his salary didn't come out of the budget that we were committing to Afghanistan. His salary was paid by ICCR from the government of India as well. So, anyway, this was just a little example to show why the Indian program is what it was. And this is the reason why. The Indian program became, um, we did all kinds of things. You know, we were supplying 100 grams of high protein biscuits to more than a million school children in the remotest parts of Afghanistan every day as a nutrient supplement. And they would be dropped using helicopters, etc., etc., uh, in remote areas, even in winter, uh, through the United Nations World Food Program. We set up, rebuilt the pediatric hospital, we set up cold storages, we rebuilt roads, we set up power transmission lines, dams, you know, all kinds of things. Uh, health camps, and so on and so on. And as a result of this, year after year, if you look at it, uh, various foundations undertake a survey about, uh, you know, India and other countries and so on. And you find that India is invariably presented as the most popular country. And which is a fact. Uh, so, but this affection that has been built up is has been built up because of, I would say, because we share a vision about Afghanistan. And this vision of Afghanistan is of an Afghanistan which is an independent, which is sovereign, which is stable, which enables all its multiple ethnic communities to coexist and co-prosper. <laughs> and an Afghanistan which can once again become crossroads for trade and commerce as it used to be in centuries gone by. 
This is the shared vision which makes it possible for us to enjoy the kind of affection that we do. Now what happens is that I think of late there has been a lot of, uh, you know, talk about oh the Americans are leaving, security situation, what is going to happen. As I explained to you, the security transition and the political transition are fragile. Strategy does not mean, um, you know, that you always are splashing around widely or things like that. You know. Let's say you're a long distance runner, you know when to spurt, when to hold back, when to make a dash, when to take a deep breath, or if you're a swimmer, you know, when to, uh, when to get extra speed and so on. There was a time when President Karzai, when he signed the strategic partnership agreement with the United States, there was a feeling that perhaps in 2014 we would be much better placed in terms of our security linkages with Afghanistan. That has not happened. We are still not actively engaged. I mean, we provide training to some of the, we provide training to the Afghan army, their officers, their men come here, police, uh, specialized training and so on. But we are not actively involved and we have not been. Now as far as the reconciliation, political reconciliation with Taliban is concerned, it is something which has so far, uh, the Americans have a kind of a strangle, the Pakistanis have a kind of stranglehold on it, and the Americans have not been able to break that strangle. Somewhere, in terms of real politics, I guess, the Americans know this, and as they have withdrawn from Afghanistan, they also realize that whatever they may say publicly, but I, I believe that, uh, at least in the near term, their dependency on Pakistan will be greater. Does this mean that all the goodwill that we have earned is uh, finished? Does this mean that all the good work that we've done is over? Does this mean we should close down our embassy and come home? No, of course not. It means that but today, if we therefore start talking about that everything is lost, I don't think that that is the right strategy. Stra patience is also part of strategy. I mean, that's how it is in real life as well. And we have to, uh, we have to, we have certain advantages because we are one of the few countries, as I said, which is which enjoys a certain credibility. And we enjoy this credibility with all sections of the people, not just with the Pashtuns with the Pashtuns, with the Tajiks, with the Hazaras, with the Pancheris, with the Uzbeks and so on. Across the entire country because we have done more than 300 projects across the entire country. And that is the strength of the relationship. We don't have to necessarily get worked up about the fact that, oh, if the Taliban come back, then what happens? Also, please remember in 13 years there has been a sea change Today, 60% of the Afghan population is below 90 years ago. 60%. 60% of the Afghan population has a mobile phone. More than 60% have access to television and they do the equivalent of Afghan Idol. In their, you know, like the American Idol show, they put up things like Afghan Idol and stuff like that. It's not going to be a similar Taliban which is going to come back. It cannot have a similar kind of a control. If they try to do some kind of a complicated power sharing, it is going to be extremely short. -lived. I don't think, I think we should wait. I think we should have patience. I think we should continue the good work we are doing. Obviously, we will take more security precautions now, perhaps than we did earlier. Although we've had some uh, pretty bad incidents of kidnappings. And as you know, in 2008, the Indian embassy was attacked. So all of that will continue and while preparing for that, we are not going to in any way back up and come home uh, because now suddenly things have gone bad. I think the good work that we have done is going to last us to make sure that our presence now is a presence which is going to, there, going to be there for much longer because we have made the Afghans believe in a vision that both are in India and Afghanistan share. And patience is going to be, will need to be another important part of that strategy. Just hand wringing or breast beating is not the answer to this. Thank you.